Okay, well, that book uh, being here is, is really useful because on page 220, Velikovsky talks about the Hittite king Superluliuma uh, capturing the fortress of Karkovish in 664 BC. Now, the talk I gave this time last year to another uh, small but specialised audience um, followed uh, the history about 50 years before that to the, uh, to the time when Superluliuma takes the the fortress of Karkamish, um, agreeing of course with what Velikovsky put in his book. Um, what I want to do today is say, well, if he did actually capture Karkamish in 664 BC, what does the archaeology of Karkamish say? Does that agree with Velikovsky or prove him to be wrong? Just to show you where Carchemish is, if you can follow up the river Euphrates, uh, very important strategic site. It's right on the banks of the Euphrates in northern Syria. Uh, the citadel of, of the city was quite high and uh, gave a marvellous view of the surrounding land. In fact, it is a strategic place today. Uh, there is on the citadel of Karkamish, as we speak, a barracks of the Turkish army. Still there. Uh, Karkamish is actually slightly in Syria, mostly in Turkey. So you can imagine why it's, it's important today. Uh, it was important thousands of years ago. It still is in that respect. And we'll come back to that because uh, at one time the whole site was mined. Now just to go back and say I've been uh, writing on this subject for rather a long time and all those things in red are articles of one form or another that I've written on the subject of redating the whole Hittite period uh, in line with with Velikovsky's ideas which is a massive change. The dates on the left are conventional dates, but if you follow Velikovsky, then there's about a 700 year reduction in the dates in what Velikovsky said. And as I said, over the years, I've shown that that seems to work rather well by covering what's called the Old Kingdom, the short, quite obscure Middle Kingdom, and then the Hittite New Kingdom, uh, sometimes referred to as the Empire because that's when the Hittites were at their most powerful uh, and uh, when eventually uh, they fought the Battle of Kadesh against Ramesses II which of course is all in the book um, and we'll find this 700 year gap will feature quite, quite a lot in, uh, in what I'm about to talk about Carchemish and Hittite history. Um, in the early days, in the Old Kingdom, Carchemish was clearly independent of the, of the Hittites themselves. The main Hittites kings lived well up in the, on the plateau uh, on, uh, in Turkey, a long way from Carchemish. Uh, the earliest reference, conventional dating about 1570 BC, uh, a king of the Old Kingdom, Hattusili I, um, they were a rival. He talks about sie besieging a, a city north of Carchemish and remarks that the army of Carchemish was on a hillside watching him. Uh, so they clearly uh, were something of a rival. Um, much later, uh, when Carchemish starts to be very important, when it was captured by Superlilium I, uh, conventional date about 1380, um, he installed his son Piasili as king of Carchemish um, and for the next 100-150 years Piasili and his immediate descendants ruled Carchemish. They're often called the viceroys of Syria because they sort of managed Syria from Carchemish on behalf of the great king who lived further north. 
So that's in conventional history, uh, the Bronze Age back in the second millennium. There are separate references to Carchemish uh, from the Assyrians in the first millennium. 858 to 848 BC, there was a guy called Sangara who was king of Carchemish. Uh, the Assyrians raided him and took a lot of booty from him uh, it, during that period. Then in the next century, another king, Pisari, is mentioned as king of Carchemish over quite a period, about 20 years. But 717, very important because that was the year that the Assyrians took Carchemish. Uh, and uh, it's in conventional history that's when the Hittite uh, involvement in Carchemish finishes. The Assyrians take it over and we'll come back quite a bit to, to that date. So that's how it features. What is a little strange is when Supiliuma took Carchemish it's spoken of a recovery of the city and yet in conventional history they never the Hittites never ruled the city before so it's a rather strange conventional history can't really explain why Supiliuma uh, it, it, all the records say about his recovery of the city but there's no evidence they actually had it before so it's, it's a little bit strange the archaeology the original dig at the site was before the First World War. Uh, Sir Leonard Woolley uh, excavated there in 1912 through to 1914. Then, of course, the First World War came. Uh, he went back in 1920 for another year. Uh, and f for, for a very long time, a hundred years more or less, that was the only archaeology of Carchemish. A great deal that Woolley discovered and over the, probably the next 30 years after he finished he was analysing all the stuff that he had uh, collected and found there uh, eventually published his eventual paper in 1952 uh, quite a bit later but uh, there is there has been and still is to this day modern excavations at Carchemish now uh, this, this is a joint Italian and uh, Turkish venture. Uh, Italian professor Niccolò Marchetti uh, leads the, uh, the archaeology there and the University of Bologna, Gaziantep and Istanbul are all involved in what has been a uh, uh, now 12 years of excavation. Uh, as, we, as I was saying just now, um, before 2011 the whole site was mined. You have to admire a professor who presumably some Turkish soldier says right we've cleared all the mines it's all yours you know yes <laughs> um, and, and as I said part of the sites in Syria which of course has been a problem for many years now uh, majority of the lower city is in Turkey the citadel the, the, where the main sort of temple was, um, the high ground, is out of bounds. It still belongs to the Turkish army. So uh, Marchetti hasn't had access to the whole site, but uh, they have done a very good job in quite difficult circumstances. Now, on to what Woolley found originally. Uh, he discovered quite quickly a, an absolutely major set of, of sculpture and, and building work and uh, one of the great parts is called the Great Wall of Sculpture because it is, it's 35 metres long it's standing stones with, with uh, life-size carvings on them this is just a, a part of, of it um, basically you've got the God, Goddess, God, Goddess at the start and then there's various more uh, goddesses and things and then eventually it gets round to showing several chariots uh, and behind those infantry so it's a great long procession uh, led by by gods and goddesses but then followed by um, a, a lot of infantry the the drawings are by uh, 
by David Hawkins, who, who was one of the great uh, British uh, experts in the Hittites, you can see from the, the line that what was actually found are the bits, the, the head of, of the, the second figure, the goddess, wasn't found, most of the next god wasn't found, and only a bit of the next one. Th those pictures are reconstructed, but luckily that part of the, the Great Wall is repeated exactly at another site about 20 miles away, called Sincerely. So between the two, they were, Hawkins is able to draw what was there. The carvings of the chariots and soldiers, complete. You know, complete pictures there. So as I said, 35 metres of, of relief carvings. And this is a, <clears throat> an artist's impression of what it all looked like. You can see the end of the procession, the front of the procession, and, and just start of the chariots and things on the Great Wall. But this led to the Great Staircase. And Woolley uh, recovered most of this, this staircase. And as you can see, there's more carvings on the wall of the staircase further up. And can you see a, a carving of a lion? In fact, there were two. The lions are, are facing one another uh, up, up uh, on part of the staircase. And the staircase leads to the citadel, to the high ground. Um, besides all that, the Great Wall of Sculpture is actually on the side of a massive palace. So the building work was phenomenal. Uh, there is a, beyond that wall, over the back, was a large palace also built at the same time. Quite a good wall to have on the side of your house, isn't it? <laughs> Woolley describes it. Uh, as, he, as he imagined it. The long wall of sculpture celebrating the rebuilding of the storm god's temple. The storm god is the first god, the, the most important one at the front. And the return of the gods to its shrine. A line of infantry and chariotry, the latter still on the field of battle, treading down the enemy, advance towards the temple, the gods at their head. And at, on the stairway, the, the wall's end, the procession of welcome awaits them. So the procession looks like it's something to do with the taking of the city because you've got the gods returning to their shrines but you've got the infantry and the chariotry still involved a little bit you know the chariot uh, has some poor individual being crushed underneath him the other major uh, piece on the sculpture was a separate very large statue uh, and this is separate on a podium in front of the soldiers, not on the wall, but, but separated to it. Initially, uh, they thought it was another god um, because only the, the bottom of the statue was available. But comparing it with this other site, sincerely, where a large statue uh, was there, they realize it's identical. And it's not, a, it's not the statue of a god, it's a statue of an actual ruler, a king or something. The sculptures themselves, all of them, are associated with a guy called Sukis and his son Katuwas, who don't refer to themselves as kings, they call themselves country lords of Carchemish. And they record uh, a, a lot of their, uh, their work uh, in hieroglyphic inscriptions, and mentioned two earlier generations, another Sukis and this guy called Astuwatomanzas. So there were four of them. Th there are earlier sets of sculpture separate from, from the ones we've seen called the Watergate and the Herald's Wall. They are probably the work of the earlier family members, Sukis the first as he's called. Um, but the, the main work was undoubtedly uh, done by Sukis II, the father of, of Catuus. So there's, there's four of them, if you like, in the dynasty. One of the s interesting things from this period, Hawkins points out, that there's an inscription that mentions a great king, Tutkalia. Now, there were a few kings called Tutkalia 
in the Empire period. So if you like, there's a pointer there as to when the sculpture might have been done. But Woolley had a real problem trying to sort out the dating. And one of the reasons were these two lions. Uh, the one on the left is a drawing. There are four different lions at Carcamish. They're all exactly the same and none of them exist in, in completeness. Uh, but Hawkins has put together a picture of what the lions look like at Carcamish. And uh, this is his picture of one of the lions. You know, they, they were up on the great staircase facing one another. The other lion, that's an actual photograph, a uh, modern photograph of uh, uh, what appears to be a very similar lion. But that one is on what, not surprisingly, is called the Lion Gate at Hattusa, the capital of, of the Hittite land in Anatolia, about 200 odd miles northwest of Carchemish. Now, we won't go through them in detail, but if you look at them, the stance is the same, the, the head is sort of tipped up with the nostrils showing, the shape of the, of the nose, the eyes, the ears, uh, the mouth, the tongue hanging out. They are almost identical. Notice as well, most peculiar, they've both got a pointed head. Uh, <laughs> lions don't usually have pointed heads, but these two do. Now, when Woolley, when he found the lion at uh, Carchemish, he knew about the Lion Gate as well. And clearly this said, all this sculpture is from the Empire period, 1300, 1350, something like that. Because that's, that's what that one undoubtedly dates from. Uh, so first thinking, not too difficult, all this dates to the Empire period. So Woolley wanted to date the sculptures to the second millennium because there are, there are so, much, so many similarities with the sculpture at Hattusa, the Hittite capital. And this would put Carchemish and all this sculpture in the 1300s somewhere. However, despite that, it was eventually concluded after much discussion that the remains must be dated much later to the first millennium. And the main reason was that the art historians, Frankfurt in particular, looked at it and said, there's no way any of this could have been executed without knowing about Neo-Assyrian art particularly the art of the 9th and the 8th centuries. So already you have a massive difference in dating possibilities. So eventually what came up, and this goes back to I think probably the 30s and 40s, still stands today, the historians came up with a compromise dating. They decided it had to be reasonably early because what about, what about those carvings that looked like 1300s? So they chose an earliest date as they could get away with and they decided about 970 to 870 BC for the four generations, Sukis and Sukis and, and Katuas and those. Um, it had to be as late as possible but then there was this Sangara guy that was there in the 850s so that's why they chose the 870s, you know, put them in front of Sangara. Um, but there was also some later Hittite sculptures from two guys called Yararis and Kamanis, which came undoubtedly after the Great War because it's attached to it. Um, so you had to have room for these. So we thought, well, that's all right. You can put those two guys in the 8th century, well after Sangara. Um, and, and so that's what they did. Um, and this dating has been generally accepted. And because Carchemish is so important in terms of uh, Hittite art in the first millennium, it more or less drives all the ideas about the development of Hittite art, because um, everything has to be related to Carchemish. But the trouble of the, with this, of course, is it's 400 years after the same Hittite New Kingdom sculpture, sculptures, like the, uh, uh, like the lions, it's 300 years after the last known great King Tutankhamun, who is mentioned. 
and actually it's about a century too early to be affected by neo-assyrian art although it was the art that was pulling it down they didn't feel they could go that far so it doesn't actually work very well even with that but there's now another problem the modern excavations have found no evidence of any work or any body at Carchemish in the 9th century between Catuus and Yararis. The convention says Catuus lived about, about 870, he, he's the last of the four, so he, he lived back at about back about 870 BC they've put Yararis and Kamanis in the middle of the 8th century a good hundred years later and yet Marchetti says I can't find any evidence in between them there's no archaeological evidence for that period so something very funny is happening pottery it's always a good dating means because it tends to hang around for a long time gets broken but doesn't rot. Woolly found by checking different uh, artifacts and things like that, the, the, the monuments that go down to Su Sukis and Catuus at Carchemish, they're associated with a style of pottery called Eunice. It's called Eunice because that's a century just next to Carchemish um, and it, it's just the, the local village where the cemetery was and uh, Woolley had excavated this, this cemetery and found artefacts in it and pottery that were exactly the same as he found in association with the palace and, and the sculpture. So everybody accepts this uh, and based on this Woolley, uh, although he was being poured at one time right into the, the, the second millennium, he originally dated the start of the Eunice style to 720 BC but people pointed out to him, you can't date the Hittite stuff this late. Three years after 20, 720 BC, the Assyrians took over the place. So he, he, so he gave that up. But in the 1970s, a pottery expert called Kenneth Sams looked at the Eunice pottery and analysed it separately. And he decided that the particular painted ware was very similar to a ware that's found in Anatolia uh, there are two types, Phrygian ware in the middle of Anatolia, Tabalian ware more near the, the old Hittite capital. Very similar ware and all that was dated to the 8th century and the 7th century. So he was actually confirming what Woolley thought that the pottery says it's all quite late. <clears throat> the modern excavations have gone back to the Eunice uh, cemetery. They have to do it quick because there's a, a, a new modern cemetery encroaching on it. Um, they have found 30 cremation burials and they all date to the 8th and the 7th century. So that they have completely confirmed what Sam's had said from looking at particular bits of the pottery. So the whole pottery thing says you've got to bring things down to the 8th and the 7th century. So, summarise the, the situation that, that we've got. You've got these four guys, uh, and they reckon four generations, that's probably 100 years of getting on that way. Conventional date puts them 970 to 870 approximately, but that was on the argument that the, the sculpture knew about Neo-Syrian sculpture. But Neo-Syrian's period doesn't start to the end of that so it's too early even to match what the what the art historians argued that brought the dating down the pottery analysis says you can rule out the 800s you've got to come down to the 700s and the 600s remember this the pottery analysis says you've got to put these four guys in that period and there's still these other two Yararis and Kamanis that come afterwards. So the analysis is pulling the date right down. The trouble is, how can it be in that period? Because 
the Hittites weren't there after 717 BC. You'd have to try and squeeze six generations into sort of 800 BC down into 720 BC. It doesn't work. So the whole thing is a mess. But notice the issues. Velikovsky redated things by 700 years. And what's happening with Carchemish is it's being pulled in two directions to try and date it. And they're 700 years apart. I've called this section the problem of Karatep. It's in quotes because it's not my title. It's a title of quite a few articles. Uh, Karatep, if we, if we look at the, see on the map, you can see where Karkamish is. Go up to the, to the right. There's Din, Din Surly, the little place that has very similar carvings of, uh, uh, of some of the Karkamish stuff. Go a bit further and you have this place called Karatep. Moving up towards the foothills of the Taurus in eastern, southeastern Anatolia, which is called Cilicia. So Karatep's not that far from Karkamish, just a bit up to one side. And it's, Karatep is an extremely important site in Hittite history. In 1947, Bossert discovered the ancient town which is called Azatewataya, built by a ruler called Azatewatas. He named it after himself. The gateway of the city had orthostats, large standing stones, with relief sculpture, which is very typical of Hittite art, but also there were inscriptions. The text on one side of the gate was written in Phoenician, and on the other side, the same text was repeated in hieroglyphic Hittite. And so Karatep has been, if you like, the Rosetta Stone of, of Hittite hieroglyphs. Um, you got, uh, it, it was the means of starting to uh, decipher the hieroglyphs. But there's another problem with Karatep. The sculpture is in Searly, quite close. Uh, had some similar uh, sculpture to that at the uh, place at uh, Karatep. The same sculpture it's in Sirli, Sirli also had exact parallels in the Sukis, the second art of Carchemish. So it appears that the artist of Zin Sirli copied scenes from both the Karatep city and from Carchemish. So not surprisingly the sculpture in Sirli was therefore dated to 870 BC to line up with Carchemish. And so, right, Karatep, dated to 870 BC, all fits nicely. But here comes the problem. The actual inscription that was so important for deciphering the hieroglyphs mentions a guy called Avaricus who lived at Adana. Adana is still there, it's a major Turkish city today and was a major city back in, in the day. Um, this guy's quite well known, he's got various inscriptions that have been found in Cilicia but he's also mentioned by the Assyrians over quite a long period, uh, 30 years. They write his name Uriki. Uh, this was a problem because this says the sculpture at Karatep must be dated with the inscription to the 730s or even a bit later. David Hawkins looks at this in a section called the problem of Karatep in the Cambridge Ancient History. Azatewatis' reign largely post-dated that of Aurorichus whose posterity he placed on the throne. He talks about looking after the descendants of Aurorichus uh, so he must be dated a bit later. Analysis of sculptural style, some of the, the sculptures at Karatep and the motives supports a late dating which uh, David Hawkins says early 7th century BC and this agrees rather well with the Phoenician inscription which should also date from about that time. So the historians had, had problems. 
A lot of the archaeology looks like the same as that at uh, Carchemish, and so some historians want to date Karatep to 860 BC. But the evidence from this guy, if it is the same guy, some historians have argued, no, there's two guys called Arawicka, so, you know, don't date it late. But if he is the same guy, which is likely, uh, and, of course, some of the other sculptures late, and the inscription is late, um, the arguments tend to say you've got to date Karatep, as Hawkins says, in the sort of 680s, 670s, something like that. So, Karatep has produced an even bigger problem for dating Karkovish. Back to the chart. You've got the conventional date. Even that really doesn't line up with Neo-Syrian Neo uh, art. Um, pottery analysis says you've got to date it later still. Karatep narrows it down and says, really, you've got to put the sculpture just in the 690s or 680s or somewhere like that. And of course this is just just doesn't work. You can't have all that Hittite sculpture when the Assyrians have got the city. So it's a major problem. Nobody does anything about it. It's, it's, it's insoluble within conventional dating. So you've got this problem. When you come down to all the evidence, including Karatep, you've got to put Sukis in the early 600s. But then you've got to find room for his son, Katuas, and for these two other guys. So, you know, the, the, it's pushing the dating down of these six guys probably beyond 600 BC. What is very good, the modern excavations led by Marchetti have found some very interesting stuff relating to the capture of the city by Sargon. Remember this is 717 BC that's worked out from uh, uh, quite detailed Assyrian records. In 2015 uh, they found a cuneiform inscription of Sargon II at Carchemish on three fragments of three separate cylinders. They found three fragments the cylinder is obviously broken. They found three fragments, but they overlap. So they, they're not from the same cylinder. They're obviously from three different cylinders, all with the same inscription. What the inscription says, uh, it talks about the capture of the city. Sargon deports Pisari, the, the uh, Hittite king there, and his supporters, destroys his palace, seizes all his riches, his booty, and even incorporates Pisari's army into this Assyrian one. It drives out the Hittites and resettles the city with Assyrians. So there is here, as has always been thought, a very clear date where the Hittites have gone. Pisari, I think, was deported to, uh, to Nineveh. Then there's evidence that having destroyed the palace of Pisari, Sargon built his own. Marchetti again. From the time of Sargon, we also recovered five inscribed baked bricks. Now, some of these bricks had al already been found by Woolley. In fact, there's one in the, uh, in the British Museum, if it hasn't been stolen recently. Um, and all the bricks are the same. They bear the inscription, Palace of Sargon, King of the World, King of Assyria. Standard epithet for Sargon. But also, the discovery in 2014 of two of these bricks in some later renovations within the area of the Palace of Katua. They call it the Katua Palace. It was built by his father, Sukis. They call it the Katua Palace because there's an inscription of Katua in it. In some later, the bricks were found in some later renovations within the area of the Palace of Katua. This made it clear that the so called Palace of Sargon was simply an adaptation of the Hittite palace. Because there's a couple of his bricks built into it. But, and these are my words, if the Katua palace, built about 200 years earlier, 
were still in good condition. And remember, it's, it's a big palace attached to the, the carved wall. If it was still there in good condition, it would have been the palace of Pisari, the king that was there. And Sargon says he destroyed that palace. If he destroyed the palace, how could he have made a simple adaptation of the building? Which he destroyed. It doesn't work. There's a really interesting comment on the modern excavations from what's called the Tay project. This is a Turkish project um, where uh, academics in Turkey are trying to write the history of their country. And so not surprisingly, there's a nice big section on the current archaeology. And he sums it up rather nicely at the bottom here. Several rooms with a complicated stratigraphy from Iron II, the Iron Age II, which is the time of Katua, you know, 900 BC or whatever, and Iron III, the time of Sargon Pierce, were identified within the Katua's palace. In other words, they can't sort out the levels. They think, you know, conventional archaeology says the palace was built around 900 BC and developed by Sargon. But actually, when they look at the stratigraphy and the levels, the palace comes after Sargon, not before. One more very interesting point which helps to explain this stratigraphy and the levels. On the southern side of the palatial compound, the great it's a big palace with a, with a big uh, open area in, in the middle. There was a group of nine rooms. Inside one of them, there was a, a very deep well, uh, which had been covered by a massive stone. It was filled with materials which had probably been thrown into it after being deliberately broken and piled at the end of the Assyrian occupation. In fact, two of the three... Uh, fragments of Sargon cylinders uh, were in the well. Other things including sealing pressures uh, of the Assyrian period. Invaders had destroyed the work of Sargon. So there's an invasion of, of Carchemish after Sargon which doesn't seem to appear in conventional history. When you look at this would anybody build a well in a room of their palace? You, you build a well outside, don't you, so people can get at it. What has clearly happened here is Sargon, some invaders came in, hated the Assyrians, and destroyed Sargon's work, threw it into a well, covered it over, and then built the palace. Um, so this is, this is one of the uh, items which shows that the, the palace was actually built after Sargon, not before. So, the dating now can fit with everything we've seen up to now. The pottery, the Neo-Assyrian art, the, the information from Karatep. It all fits if we date it like this. Sukis the I was probably around roughly in the time of Pisari, 720, 730 BC. That's when the, the Herald's Wall and the Water Gate would have been built. Then comes the Assyrian invasion uh, and Pisari's carried off and his, his palace, whatever it was, was destroyed. As to Otomanzas, there's nothing really to link him and I expect both Sukis I and his son probably were driven out of Carchemish like all the other Hittites at the time. But in the next generation, the Hittites appear to have taken Carchemish back. And Sukis then built all the Great Wall and, and the Great Staircase and the palace. And then his son Catuus would have lived. Uh, 
six thirty, something like this, and Yaris Kamanis sometime after them. And you know, there's nothing in conventional history. Everybody believes that the Assyrians, uh, after uh, they took it, kept Carchemish till Assyria was basically wiped out in the, in about six twelve BC. But but Marchetti looks at this because he knows from his excavations that he can't find anything. There is very little archaeology after what he believes was, was Sargon down to almost a Persian period. Very, very quiet. So what Marchetti comes up with, quite reasonably, because he's constrained by conventional uh, Chronology. To all appearances, Sargon aimed at making Carchemish a sort of western capital of Assyria, from which to control and administer the western territories of the empire. This vision of Carchemish was short-lived, however. In fact, the city is not mentioned in any known inscriptions of Sargon's successors. It is conceivable that the unthinkable ominous death of Sargon, which occurred about 75 BC, he was uh, killed in... in, uh, in uh, Tabal in, in Turkey. This prevented his project from being accomplished and negatively marked the destiny of Carchemish itself, which no longer attracted the interest of the Syrian kings who followed him. So that's how Marchetti explains the lack of archaeology. But the point is, it's all there, but it's, it's what he, conventional history tells him was much earlier. Compare these two statements. Top one is, is back to Woolley, his description of the long wall and the staircase. A line of infantry and charity, the latter still on the field of battle, treading down the enemy, advance towards the temple, the gods at their head. And on the stairway of, of the wall's end, the procession of welcome awaits them. Compare it with this second statement. And when he had conquered the city, since he feared the gods, on the upper citadel he let no one into the presence of the deity Kubaba, and the deity Kal, and he did not go close to any one of the temples. Remember, besides the long procession, there's a colossal statue of a ruler. It all fits. The ruler is saying, okay, we're con we conquered the city, but you don't go. The, the gods go back to their temples, but the soldiers don't. You don't go near them. That sounds like a description of, this, of what Woolley found. This was written by the Hittite king Mersili II, describing his father's, Superlulium of the I, capture of Carchemish. The greatest sculpture at Carchemish, the great wall of sculpture, the great staircase, were built to commemorate the greatest event in the history of the city. It's captured by Superluliuma. And of course Velikovsky proposed that this place bits of plate in 664, which would fit really nicely. The lions on the Great Staircase, they are contemporary with the Lion Gate at Hattusa, but it was built 700 years later than, uh, than historians believe. The chart of dating the, the various individuals at Karkovish, uh, we can now add the great Hittite kings because we've now confirmed that Superliliuma led the Hittite invasion in about, well, as Velikovsky pointed out, 664 BC. It fits. Um, and note that reference. Hawkins wasn't sure, it, he says it's in the period of Sukis I to Ketua, but he doesn't know uh, exactly the inscription that mentioned a Tud Kalia. You've now got two to choose from. In fact, for various reasons, I think, I think the uh, inscription at Karkovish from the Sukis time actually refers to Tud II, because there are other things at Karkovish that relate to that king. So, You've now, we, what we've now got, just using Carchemish and using the data as it is, 
we have exactly the dating for the Hittite great kings exactly where Velikovsky said they were we'll have a look at this later period now because there might be one or two things that would help us uh, to, uh, to confirm that notice this puts Kamanis somewhere down into the 580s, 570s, something like that this next picture is, is, is two pictures again um, to compare uh, one is a sculpture uh, that has an inscription of Kamanis on it so it, it, it dates from him it's not actually at Carchemish although we know he was one of the country lords at Carchemish it's at a place called Keke which is a bit southwest of Carchemish about 20 odd miles away and it's a, it's a god standing on a bull the other picture comes from the Ishtar Gate at Babylon um, glazed tiles uh, also of a bull it's actually what's called an aurochs um, which was a now dis, uh, extinct wild bull of Syria I won't spend a lot of time now but if you compare the two bulls the stance is the same the proportions of the bull are the same they have the same very flat face a rather unusual sort of bendy bit of horn sticking out at the front um, that you can see on both of them um, and a, an ear that seems to be a long way back on both of them the tail is the same it sticks out and then comes down uh, very long virtually to the ground with a sort of fans out at the bottom um, the sculpture has moved the tails to a slightly different position because there wasn't room on the stone block um, and you can't see it that well but the sort of stomach and, and genitals are all represented exactly the same as well these are very very similar sculptures that represent at least an artistic school and I would suggest probably one is a copy of the other they are they are very very similar um, anybody uh, modeling the bull independently I don't think would get that close and this is interesting of course because this picture dates from about the 580s BC it's in the uh, it's on the Ishtar gate at Babylon in the time of Nebuchadnezzar the second and it looks now as though that sculpture is so similar Kamanis probably does date from that sort of time you know it's 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 art so it's never a uh, hundred percent but it is very similar on the chart we showed that Sukis was country lord in the time of Supililuma his son Katua was probably therefore uh, the country lord in the time of Supililuma's son Mercilius II in his annals Mercilius II mentions that when Piasili, his, his brother king of Carchemish was under pressure from the Assyrians the king of Carchemish left Kuwatnamuas in charge of the garrison in the city so this guy with an awful name um, is clearly a very important official at Carchemish and if you, uh, if you take out some of the bits and pieces it condenses to Katuas now you might say I have no right to take those bits and pieces out to make the names the same but there is a real problem with Hittite uh, words and names Gurney the expert on, on this uh, makes the point many words contain so many extra vowels and consonants that they appear deformed out of all recognition uh, and here's a few examples names on the right Hittite names written in cuneiform it's the cuneiform that's the problem not the hieroglyphs that's alright three names written in cuneiform but we know from other countries that they are actually shorter uh, in the way they're pronounced than what's written Muwatali loses the wa uh, Supililuma in Assyrian is written as Sapalulme which takes out some of the uh, and the last one you might have to think about 
but Tawagalawas is actually the Greek Eteocles you've got the T at the front the Wa goes out the G G and K are, are voiced and unvoiced so can, can be changed uh, some of the vowels go out so my what appears to be a, an arbitrary shortening of the word uh, Kuatnamuas actually does fit with what tends to happen so I think it is quite likely that what we have here is actually the first mention of one of the uh, those six guys that we know were at Karkamish one's actually mentioned by in the right uh, role in the right place and actually at the right time based on the revi my revised chart one thing I haven't mentioned which is if you've read this you'll remember the gold tomb of Karkamish which is the strongest piece of evidence of all um, Velikovsky raised the subject uh, Peter James in Century of Darkness also picks this one up in a tomb securely dated to the 7th century BC Woolley found a series of small gold figures which bear a striking resemblance to the pantheon on the frieze at Yazlikaya that's, that's the major uh, Hittite cemetery outside the capital at, at Hattusa it's conventionally dated to the 13th century BC Gutterbock, one of the great Hittite uh, historians noted that this discovery links the late Hittite period the 600s with the time of the empire the 1300s there's no doubt that both in style and in the subject these figures are Hittite in the sense of the Hittite empire at Bogus Khoi the, these little jewels are absolutely imperial and should be 700 years earlier than where they're found 700 again back to our friend Niccolò Marchetti uh, as you see I, it's a pity in this because I seem to be criticising everything Marchetti says but I'm, I'm not I think what he's done in these new excavations is fantastic um, but the guy is constrained by conventional trying to explain things within conventional chronology the so called gold team this is Marchetti quote from Marchetti the so called gold tomb was discovered in 1920 this tomb is a cremation burial ascribed by Woolley to the 7th century BC it's the artifacts Woolley found there, there isn't any doubt as Peter James says securely dated to the 7th century actually although its golden objects were recognised as belonging to the Hittite imperial period 30, we are now inclined to date the tomb to that period his problem is he's found some more evidence that comes from the early period digging around its supposed fine spot we found a red slip bowl from that period red slip pottery is classic uh, Hittite empire pottery normally dated to the uh, 1300s and 1200s BC um, so Marchetti's problem is doubled um, he's got this tomb which is undoubtedly you know for all sorts of good reasons 7th century uh, and he's now found something else which is 13th century he's not only got the, the figurines he's got a piece of pottery now in fact this tomb as Velikovsky explains is a very important Hittite tomb um, the for a, a king or a very senior official um, the Hittites had a particular ritual the body was burnt and then um, the next day lit, uh, priestesses came and, and uh, poured wine and beer and whatever over the pyre to put it out and then the bones were buried uh, and um, usually with some form of uh, 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 of special items and this is exactly what happens here um, the tomb is a bearer of the bones the little figures actually show some damage from being dropped onto the uh, bones which weren't actually fully out 
there's a bit of fire damage uh, on it um, finding a bowl not in the tomb but left by it is exactly what you'd expect because this bowl these bowls would have been uh, chosen especially to pour the wine over the pyre to put it out so um, it's just what you'd expect to find um, but it's yet another item that ought to be 700 years old one of the arguments about the figurines is well they're an heirloom you know they're so important you know people kept them for 700 years you know that, that that's the way they justify it nobody keeps a piece of pottery for 700 years <laughs> Uh, it just it just fits in fact I'm not going into detail now but I think I know who the tomb is and you'll have to wait for my article on this subject what I am currently writing so it's lunchtime unless someone has some questions I when I I have to admit back whatever it was which you know, I'm, all, I'm always plan B, you know, if there's nobody else to give a talk, I'll, I'll, I'll give one on something. And I thought, yeah, I really ought to talk about uh, the archaeology of Carchemish, because it, you know, what Woolley found, it, it is so special in that, that case, gold tomb and all that. And I knew of the new uh, archaeology, I had a lot of the articles, and I hadn't read them. Only, only one, which was Marchetti... Uh, the reference comes up 2015 uh, Marchetti wrote a summary of, of Carchemish in the archaeology magazine that's, that's the 2015 reference I'd read that uh, which is where he's, he, 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 he says he can't find the 9th century BC um, but I hadn't read a lot of the other stuff as I did it's incredible you know I, th I think a lot of people hoped modern archaeology, better methods than Woolley, you know, a hundred years ago you know, what did he know what he was doing um, they thought it would sort it out, it hasn't, at every step at every step Marchetti has found things that confirm that what Woolley said date, date the pottery to about 720 BC for Sukis the first he was right, that's what, the, that's what it told him um, but he was persuaded that was too late. But everything they found, you know, it just all fits. Um, it, you know, it's been been quite uh, quite an exciting period reading all this because you know I was expecting, you know, like we all do. Oh gosh, you know they're going to prove me wrong, but it doesn't at all. Um, Would I be picked up on the? audio. I was going to say I'm uh, very happy with everything you said, except how downdated another 30 years. I think that uh, Volkus Koi Citadel was built by Nabonidus whilst Nebuchadnezzar was still yeah. alive. Yeah. So that puts your yeah. last king during the reign of Nabonidus, which looked absolutely right on your date. Yeah. But the yeah. Sargon date, I think, is 30 years later. Yeah, I mean, uh, well, I, yeah, I think Velikovsky was right because, of course, what Velikovsky, Velikovsky just picked this out, he didn't do all the other dating, he picked out 664 BC because he identified the Egyptian queen as the queen of Taharka. Now, unless you're going to move Taharka, it is 664 BC. I'm not moving to Harka. Well, I am moving to Harka, but I don't think the, the, the Egyptian queen was to Harka's wife. Mm, well, I let's, let's put it this way. Wife. To Harka has the right name, and his queen is the only one with the right name that fits. Uh, and the political situation fits perfectly. There is hardly any time in the history of Egypt where the queen would write to somebody else outside Egypt and say, Please let me have your son as as uh, as my f husband and, and pharaoh, and that's because she wasn't Egyptian; she was Ethiopian. I disagree with and you. Her husband but I won't argue died. with it here. Can I get back to a, a, a point Velikovsky made that's almost essential uh, for his argument, and that's that the 
um, war annals written by Ramesses II are in fact the annals of the king in the Bible called Nico, Nikos. Yes, he is. He, yes, he, he equated them together. Yeah. But do you agree that he's right about that? Uh, yeah, yeah. So, Neko. But the, this the, the point, argument is, is, is Neko's a nickname. The, 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 um, well, it means mighty, so. It means conqueror. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it, mean, it means conqueror. And, and it, it's, it's a poking fun at Ramesses because. He, he was the most flamboyant of all the, you know, he was the great conqueror, he didn't even win the Battle of Kadesh, though he said he did. Um, but again, that pulls the dating down, if, if you're right, hmm. or if you're supporting Verkovsky's identification of the writer of those war animals, then again the dating is pulled down. No, it isn't, because... The Battle of K Velikovsky argued the Battle of Kadesh was the Battle of Karkovich. Um, so it puts Ramesses in 605 BC. 605, yeah. Yes. Yeah. 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 It, uh, it, yeah. It, it just it, what he did fits very well. Yeah. Yeah. I have read about Hittites. It's not my subject by any means, but. Uh, Whereabouts in the Bible does one point uh, a brief history? Well, the reason we call them Hittites yes. is th th they shouldn't be called. You notice, I, I should explain, the, the names of, 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 of Hittites, the guy I, I pronounce Sukis, you know, because once you read about it, you know that the H is, has to be pronounced the KH. And historians realise that. The word isn't Hittite, the word's Kati, K-H-A-T-T-I, for the place. And so they could be called, they should be called Katites. But the trouble is, we all got used to Hittites because they appear in the Bible. Uriah the Hittite, who's uh, Bathsheba and all that in the time of David. The main, the main reference to the Hittites is in the time of Elijah where the Syrian king Ben-Hadab was uh, besieging Samaria in, in time of Ahab and, and Ahab uh, is under, you know, under siege but then the, the Syrians suddenly clear off and, and it says that um, oh, he, he must have got wind that either the Egyptians or the Hittites are in the area, you know and clearly either of them would be far too strong for Ben Haddad, so he's gone. And I remember David Roll saying, in, in I think a test of time, I can't sort this one out, because this says the Hittites and the Egyptians are very strong powers at that time. You know, these are the two people that the Bible says, you know, could have frightened uh, uh, Ben Haddad off. Um, in, in the new chronology or, or in uh, um, the centuries of darkness chronology the Hittites are a minor uh, people at that time but of course uh, in, in the Velikovsky chronology they're not in the time of Ahab the Hittites are very it's all about the Hittites and the, and the uh, Egyptians so the Bible fits yeah so they're called Hittites Simply because the Bible calls them Hittites. Well, I was reading the commentary on this part of the, uh, the biblical history with respect to the uh, Hittites, and he concluded that uh, most of the uh, scholars uh, in, in the early times didn't even know these people existed. No. And he goes on to say, but now there is a museum in Turkey. Uh, uh, yeah, to yeah. Time. Well, and he say this this Tay project, the Turk, yeah. the Turk should, um Yeah, there is because what happened with the Hittites? Um, they're mentioned in the Bible, but nobody, you know, Hittite. What, where does that come from? You know, um, and they mentioned, of course, it, it being near Samaria in 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 regionally southern Syria. Um, 
what happened was in the what was it the about the 860s 870s they started finding these hieroglyphs in Syria and they knew they were quite different to the Egyptian hieroglyphs mm -hmm. and I think it was Sais uh, who um, who identified these with the Hittites because um, where the Hittites uh, were, they weren't really known at that time and it was it was um, they're mentioned in one or two places so Sais thought these you know, these people are, are around in northern Syria and the Bible says, you know, the Hittites were important, so the, this must belong to the Hittites, which was a good guess at the time. Mm -hmm. It was only in about 90, just over 1900 when um, the uh, Egyptian records of the Battle of Kadesh were deciphered and of course it, it was all about the Hittites defeating the Egyptians well the Ramesses didn't quite say he was defeated but he clearly was um, and of course that caused the main problem because it then linked them to the, Hitt to the, the Egyptians and they all had because originally the Hittites from the information they had were dated not far off what I've been arguing it was only the finding of the Egyptian record of the Battle of Kadesh that said ah they fought against Ramesses II and he's 1280 BC or something you know move them all back and date them up there um, uh, and then and, and of course the funny thing uh, sort of ironic thing Woolley had worked out a lot of stuff from what he found and he found uh, hieroglyphic inscriptions written by Sukis well, well it, was, it was next to a picture of Sukis's wife so he assumed it was Sukis um, and another one by Catullus um, but he couldn't decipher them it wasn't until the, the sort of 47 when they found the the sort of uh, uh, bilingual inscription at Karen Tep. They, they and by the 50s they could they could read quite a bit of the hieroglyphs but uh, yeah so Willie did quite well see and he, he discovered all these pictures and couldn't make any sense of them. Uh, the funny thing was there's a bit of suspicion about Woolley's work at Carchemish just before the First World War because his right hand man was T. Lawrence Lawrence of Arabia and it's always believed Lawrence there's a, I've, I've got a picture actually which would be in my articles and, and Woolley uh, beside th that great carving of the chariot and uh, th there's great suspicion at the time and even in modern time that Lawrence was actually there spying for the British government and was nothing to do with the archaeology <laughs> Because when Woolley decided to go back after the war, Lawrence didn't go with him. <laughs> 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 <laughs>